Let's welcome our apostle, Benny Mama. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, we are grateful to you. We love you. We adore you. Our faith is in you. Our trust is in you. In the month of November, we are depending on you. We are relying on you. And we honor you and we bless you now. In Jesus' name. Can we celebrate the Lord Jesus this morning? Hallelujah. Father, thank you. We praise you. We honor you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we do something this morning? If you can just grab somebody's hand that is next to you, uh, because we believe that when we pray, things happen whenever we pray. You just grab somebody's hands, and, and I want you to speak a word of blessing uh, uh, on the person that you're holding their hands. Ask God to do something special in their lives in this month of November. Will you, will you ask God to intervene in their lives? Open your mouth. Pray for the person you're holding their hands. Say, Father, bless them. Lord, touch them. Do something brand new in the month of November. For the person I'm holding their hands, I pray for healing. I pray for protection. I pray for divine intervention this morning in the lives of the one we are holding their hands. I pray for those watching us this morning. Whatever they are going through, we speak healing. We speak blessings. We speak life to you wherever you are. Whatever you're facing this morning, we declare that you are blessed and you are healed and it is well with you in Jesus' mighty name. If you believe that, let's celebrate the Lord Jesus this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to a brand new month. Amen. Can you hug two, three people before you sit down this morning? Just go to them and say, so good to see you. So good to see you. So good to see you. I love you this morning. Happy Sunday. Happy brand new month. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Woo! Happy Sunday. Hallelujah. Thank you, Minister Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Well, 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 thank you for joining us today. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Yeah, whether it's your first time coming to church, we are so excited that you are here this morning. And God has a word for you this morning that is going to build your faith up and encourage your faith. Amen. 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 Can we welcome our streaming live audience this morning? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. We love you. I don't know what part of the world you are watching us from today. We are glad that you've chosen to fellowship with us. We are glad you've chosen to hang out with us today. Your life is going to be built up. You're going to be encouraged this morning through the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Well, that song was so timely about when we go. I don't know about you, but when the song was going, I said, wow, this is so timely. Uh, there's so much shaking and so many difficulties and challenges going around. But you know what, church? Our faith is in Jesus Christ. Amen. And no matter what happens, we're going to come out on top at the end of the day. Amen? Amen. Well, the message this morning, I'm going to talk to you about when God doesn't. When God doesn't. Now, when God doesn't. Have you ever, in your life, ever asked questions such as, why me? Why now? Why am I going through this situation? Why is this happening to me? Well, if you have never had such moments in your life, keep living. There, there are things that will happen in your life. There are situations that will occur in your life. And you're going to be asking such questions. Either in your life or in the life of a loved one. Uh, maybe a son, a daughter, a husband, a wife. And that will make you to begin to wonder, why, why me? Why am I going through this very situation? Uh, well, the answers are not so, uh, so clear. We can just, I mean, we don't have fast answers for when such moments happen. In 27 years of pastoring over Commerce Christian Fellowship, there are things that have happened to members of our church, that are things that have happened to people that I pastor, that sometimes they've come to me and said, Pastor, why now? 
Why me? Why am I going through this? Here is the reality of our life. It is not uncommon to the human experience. You know, Paul says something in Corinthians. He said, there is nothing you want. He said, there is no temptation. There is no trial. There is no difficulty. There isn't anything I go through, you go through, that is not common to the human experience. Everybody goes through that. And can I tell you something? Faith does not immunize you from going through lives of difficulties. Faith prepares you. Faith, and you heard the song that when, when things, when the rain came, when the wind blew, I put my faith in Jesus Christ. Because at the end of the day, I'm not going under. Can I tell you something? You are not going under regardless of what you're going through right now. You will not go under. Your faith is going to sustain you. Your faith is going to carry you through. And you are going to come out on the other side of life. Amen. So this morning, we're going to be exploring the book of Habakkuk. We're going to be reading from the book of Habakkuk. I know for some of you, you've never heard the word Habakkuk before. But he's one of the minor prophets. He's not minor because his message is minor. He has a major message. It's only three chapters. So we refer to him as a minor prophet. Not because his message is minor or insignificant, but it's because it's a very small book. He was about 30 years old. He was a young man. Amazingly, when we read through the scripture and we hear about the prophets or the disciples of Jesus, we think that they were 30, 40, 50 years. No. Jesus was 30 years old when he called his disciples. And can I tell you something? All of the 12 disciples were less than 30 years. Because in the rabbinical order, the followers are not supposed to be older than the rabbi. So whether it's Peter, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all of them, they were about in their early 20s. They were very, very young. Which is good news. That no matter how young you are, God can use you in an... Yeah, that you don't have to waste your life in riotous living. You know, the scripture says in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, it says, remember now your creator in the days of your youth. In other words, God is saying, give me your youth. Give me your strength. Don't wait till you're about to die. Give God the best part of your life. Amen. So I said to young people, you don't, you don't have to go out there. You can have an encounter with God. You can have a passionate walk with God at, at, at a very young age. God wants to do exploits through you. We read about the three Hebrew boys and Daniel. They were, they were less than 22 years old. And yet there are visions of God. And God used them in a mighty way. So the idea of saying, well, let me live my life right now. And then when I get old, I'll turn my life over to God. No. Give God. God, the best part of your life. You know, give him the best part of your life now. Don't wait because by then you have too many regrets in your life. You know, I hear people say, you know, I was on drugs and God delivered me. And that's wonderful and we praise God for that. But you know God's best design for you is that you didn't even mess up with drugs at as, all. As well. That's God's best for you. But regardless of where you are, the provisions, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus makes his power available to set us free from every bondage, every shackle, and every hold that the devil has on our life. Let's celebrate Jesus this morning. Amen. Amen. So, so we're going to be summarizing the book of Habakkuk. You know, the book of Habakkuk. So the book of Habakkuk is about uh, what something was happening in the land. It's about a conversation between a man and God. Or it's about a man who was having an argument with God because things were happening that he did not like. Things were going on. That pretty much what is happening in our society today, lawlessness, uh, uh, people turning their backs on God, murder, uh, the judicial system messed up. Everywhere, bribery, corruption, and there were all kinds of things going on. And Habakkuk was having a conversation and an argument with God. So if you are following me today, uh, the book of Habakkuk, if you are writing, is summarized under this. Number one, a man having argument or conversation with God. If you are taking note, he's having an argument or a conversation with God. Then number two, the answer comes. 
And then the third part of it is that he accepts God's answer. So number one, there is an argument. This is a summary of the book of Habakkuk. This summarizes chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three. So chapter one is about Habakkuk has issues with what was going on in the land. So let's go to the book of Habakkuk now, and then we're going to read it. So he said, how long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere. Can we say violence is everywhere in our land today? Okay. Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this mystery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. Isn't that what is happening in our political discourse today? There's a lot of argument. Hey, by the way, make sure you go vote. Right? Somebody said, well, one of them is God's choice. No, it's the people's choice. No, you go vote. You know, because we have to begin to argue that. Is God the one that selects the people or is God the one that selects the people? You and I do the selection. How? By voting. Amen. Because if you say God is the one that selects people, are you telling me he selected Adolf for Hitler? Are you saying he selected Idi Amin of Uganda? I know some of you have never heard of him. Are you saying that he's responsible for genocide? No. It is the people's choice. The people say, we want to make our own choice. So God said, fine, you'll make your choice, but you'll live with the consequences. Amen. Amen. Now, by the way, if you're going to vote, I hope you have voted. If you haven't voted yet, you look at the issues. Number one, you are not a Democrat. You are not a Republican. You are a Christ follower. That's who you are. You know, and just because you voted Donald Trump, don't mean you are a bad person. Just because you voted Kamala Harris, don't make you a bad person. It's just your own conscience and your own value system. Can I tell you something? On both platforms, there are good on the Republican side. There are bad on the Democratic side. Both sides of the aisle. I do not personally, I don't agree with everything the Republican stands for. I don't agree with everything the Democrat stands for. So, which issue is more pertinent to you? Which one is more issue to you? Uh, uh, remembering this, that whatever choice you make, the next four years, you are now will live with him. If you look at Kamala Harris, if you look at Donald Trump, whose character agrees with your own value system? I didn't say it's Kamala Harris. I did not say it's the, uh, 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 Donald Trump. I'm saying who best represents your value? Who will you be proud to tell your children that is my president? So, and then whose value? Because if you look at that, the Republican side, they have the issue of abortion. You know? And, and, and abortion is a big deal. I don't agree that we should be committing abortion as God's people. No, that's not God's plan for humanity. That we keep aborting children. If you are aborting, that's not God's best for your life. You see, you see how quiet you become right now when I start talking about that? You know? No, no, abortion is not of God, right? And the Republican stands for anti-abortion. But then when you go to the, uh, the Democrats, uh, there is social justice. And because as black people, because of what black people have gone through over time, over life... Social justice really weighs in on their conscience and that affects them the way they vote as well. But whichever way you vote, overcomers is Jesus' church. Ah, come on, it's Jesus' church. If you voted for Donald Trump, you are my brother, you are my sister. If you voted for Kamala Harris, you are my brother, you are my sister. Whoever you voted for, that make you a bad person. It just shows that that's, that's what is weighing on your own conscience. Vote your conscience in this very election. Amen. And we pray that the peace of God will rule in America. Amen. 
that there will be no violence, and that things will go well in the election of 2024. Amen. All right. So here is what what we're going to cover today. is the men having argument. Argument with God about why bad things happening. By the way, let's talk about the origin of evil. Why does bad things happen to people? Why do bad things happen? Why is it that some children are born with autism? Why are some children born with Down syndrome? Why? Is God the cause of it? Is God the originator? Is it God that caused some children to have autism? These are real life issues. Is it God that is responsible for all this situation? Because there are people who are dealing with children with autism. And sometimes they, theologically are wondering, is, is it God that caused my child to have autism or, or to have Down syndrome or to have, I saw a picture of co-joined twins. Is, is God responsible for all these uh, birth challenges that people go through? And, and so there are some people who believe that it's God, that God is responsible for everything. But if God is good, then why will he allow things like that to happen to people if God is good? And that is the argument a lot of people have, that if God is a good God. Hey, God is a good God. That's just the truth about that. You know, the Bible says in James 1, 17, every good and every perfect gift comes from who church? From God. So God is a good God, and he's the author and the or- or originator of everything that is good. But then we, then, we, then we have to deal with the issue of all these issues of, of uh, divorce and murder and all these bad things happening to people. Uh, uh, so, so we have to deal with it. Well, to deal with it, we have to go back to the origin. In, 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 in Romans chapter 5, here's what the scripture tells us in Romans chapter 5 and verse number 12 in the Passion Translation. Now pay attention to what it says. It says, when Adam sinned, are you, list, are you looking at the screen? When Adam sinned, the entire world was... Well, Pastor, are you telling me that Down syndrome, that before... Adam sinned, there was no Down syndrome. That's what I'm telling you. Because if you read Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says that the one, he created everything. And what did he say? He said it was what? The two, everything he made, it was what? The three, the four, the five, the six, everything God made, here was God's declaration. It was what, church? But after Adam sinned, after Adam fell, that's when the entire world was affected. The birth process was also affected. The reproductive system was also affected as well. The reproductive system. All that was affected. Why? The Bible said the entire world, everything. What we see today about a global warming, warming rather, that's part of the fall of man. The moment man sinned against God. The moment man violated God's word. The whole world was affected. Sin entered human experience. Now, sin was not created. Sin was not created. Sin was a man or a woman who exercised their will against the creator of the universe. So sin is not created. So sin entered human experience. And then look at what happened. And death was what? The the result. And so death followed this sin, casting a shadow over what church? All humanity. Because all have sin. So sin cast shadow on reproduction, on life, on, on death, on sicknesses, on diseases. That sin cast it. So what happened was that sickness and diseases used the vehicle of sin to enter into the world. Right? So, so death is the passenger of sin. Uh, uh, birth challenges and defects, it's a passenger of sin. 
right? Sin is the gateway or the entry point to every evil you can see on planet Earth. Sin is a vehicle on which every evil thing rolled on in order to come to planet Earth. So God is not the originator. God is not the, the and, and there's something we call permissive and causative. If you look at the man, Norman Geisler is a theologian, and he spoke extensively about that, that just because God omitted something, that does not mean he caused it. Right? That, that, that permissive is not the same as causative. That God allowed sin, he allowed man to exercise his will, does not mean that God is the one who caused it. Are you hearing me right now, church? And look at your life. There are a lot of things you do, and God permits you to do it. If you choose not to serve him, he says, that's fine if that's what you want to do. Am I right about that? So it does not mean he casts it. Because if you look at the Old Testament, I think we read that on Friday, during our service on Friday, about how we read in the book of Numbers chapter 21, that God sent fiery serpents to bite the children of Israel. No, that, that's a mischaracterization. That's a misrepresentation of God. Because as a human being, I'm the father of an 11 years old. And if my son rebels against me, I'm not going to take a, a, a cobra snake and throw it in his crib or throw it in his bed to teach him a lesson. If I would not do that with all my proclivities, with all my issues as a human being, how much more the heavenly father? So, so I want to talk to you this morning. I know there's been a, a misrepresentation, a mischaracterization, but that was based on the revelation that we're walking in. When we investigate this God, the fact remains still, he is good. You know, the psalmist says something. He said, for the Lord is what, church? God is a good God. He's not your problem. He's on your side. He's not fighting you or resisting you. He's on your side. He's on your side. And so let's, let's go back to uh, our discourse right now. Or oh, maybe I need to show you uh, uh, more scriptures. Uh, so, so there is also this argument that if something bad happens to you, it's because you sinned. Right? That, 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 that if your child has some birth defects, that is because you must have done something wrong. Or that when something happened, well, you must have sinned. Well, Jesus addressed this in John's Gospel, chapter 9, about the man that was born blind. So they came to Jesus in John's Gospel, chapter 9, and verse number 1. I'm sure they're going to project it. Afterward, as Jesus walked down the street, he noticed a man blind from when church birth he was born blind and verse 2 says the disciples came to him and asked him teacher who sin or what is the origin of this man's blindness is it because he sinned wait a minute how can he sin when he was born uh, he was blind from the mother's womb what sin has he committed while he was in his mother's womb he hasn't committed any sin you know, so they say, was it his own sin or the sin of his parents? Now, you have to understand that before Jesus came on the scene, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they were operating with a different theological understanding of who God is. And Jesus actually came to reveal the heart of the Father, the goodness of Jesus came to demonstrate to humanity that the heavenly Father is a good Father. Jesus said, no, it's not his Father. And it's not his mother. It happened to him so that you could watch him experience God's miracle. So whatever is happening in my life, in my son's life, in my daughter's life, God said, I didn't cause it. Even though the devil caused it, I'm still going to help you to experience God's miracle power in your life. That's good news. That regardless of what I'm going through, God is going to help me turn things around. He's going to strengthen me to help me get these things done. So let's, let's go right now. So here is the argument between Habakkuk 
and God. He's arguing with God about the things that were happening. After the, the death. So, so because of the lawlessness and what was happening, King Josiah was the king who just died. He was a good king. He was a godly king. He led Israel to follow God and to serve God. After he died, lawlessness came. Chaos came. And, and Habakkuk goes to God and says, wait a minute. Don't you see what is happening in the land? He prayed. He fasted. Yet nothing was happening. Here was his desire. His prayer was, God will raise another King Josiah. That will be a godly man. That will do a good job. Yet there was no answer. There was silence. And when the answer came, it was not in line with what he was praying for. One of his arguments was, God, why are you silent? How come you are not doing anything? How come you are so quiet about what I'm telling you? Have you ever prayed for your husband to change? And yet it appears as God is silent on the matter. Okay, maybe you've never been there. Have you ever prayed for your son or for your daughter, for God to do something, and yet there is total silence? It appears as he's not saying nothing. Have you ever in your walk, being in a place where he's not saying anything to you. Now, those are very crucial moments in our life. What do you do when God is silent? Because you have moments whereby it appears as God is what? He's silent. He's not saying anything. I'm praying for my husband, yet there's total silence. I'm praying for my wife, there's no change. He's not saying nothing. And so Habakkuk is frustrated. Say, how long do I call before you do something about the nation of Judah? Don't you see the debauchery? Don't you see the evil? Don't you see what is going on? Why are you silent? At least that's the way I'm feeling. But he's not the only one who has issues with the silence of God being silent. In Job 30, verse number 20, Job had the same situation. You know what he went through in Job chapter 30, verse number 20? He said, I cry to you, O God, but you don't answer. I stand before you, but you don't even look. What's going on, God? Why are you silent? Why are you not doing anything about me? And then we see again the book of Psalm. David had the same issue in the book of Psalm 22 from 1 to 2. My God, my God, why have you what? Abandoned me. Why are you so far away when I groan for help? Verse number 2 says, every day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. Every night I lift my voice, but I find no relief. So what do you do? When it seems as God is silent. No, 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 no. How you interpret the silence of God will affect your life. Can I tell you what the atheist says about the silence of God? You know what the atheist says about that when God is silent, it, that his silence is, is because he does not exist. No, that's what the atheists believe. That's their interpretation of God's silence. But you and I, as believers, we cannot interpret God's silence like those who don't know God. Oh, you know what some people also believe? That the silence of God is the absence of God. That the reason why he's silent is because he's absent. He does not exist. But the devil is a liar. Just because he is silent does not mean he does not exist. Even in times of silence, he is still God. I don't, today's teaching is going to sound very, very theological. But it's dealing with real life issues. Now, whenever God is silent, what does it mean? How do I interpret God's silence? Because from time to time, you're going to experience the silence of God. Never allow the devil to fill in the blank when God is silent. When you pray for a job and it hasn't happened yet, don't let the devil fill in the blank for you. When you pray for your daughter to be healed and the answer hasn't come yet, never allow the devil to fill in the blank for you. Hello, church. Amen. No, no, just because he's silent does not mean he is absent. He says, I will never leave you, and I will never 
never forsake you. So no matter, even in that time, he's right there with you. Even when you're going through tough times and it appears as though God is not there, he is there. The Bible calls him the ever-present help in times of trouble. He's always present. His name is Jehovah Shammah, the God who is, the God who is always present. If, if you look through scripture, you will see moments when God was silent. When God appears to be silent, even though you may not see what he's doing, He's still working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even though I can see him, he's working. Okay, you don't know the song. Yeah, he never stop. He never stop working. Child of God, even in that moment, he's walking behind the scene. He's maneuvering things. He is at work. There's never a time in your life that is not working. Come on, say amen. What about when they put Joseph in the pit? Where was God? He's working. <laughs> what about when they, they kill the lion, the, lion the, the animal, and put the blood on his coat? God was working. How about when he was shipped to Egypt? God was walking behind the scene. How about when he ended up in Potiphar's house? God was still working. How about when Potiphar's wife lied on Joseph? God was still working. How about when he ended up in prison? God was still working. And at the end of the day, they saw the outcome of what he's been working on. They saw the outcome. And so I want to encourage you. Even though it appears as though God is silent, I want you to know that behind the scene, he is at work. Habakkuk was frustrated. He said, don't you see the evil in the land? Aren't you going to do something about this? Aren't you going to answer? And here's the second part of it. Here's the second part of it. And we're going to read that in the book of Habakkuk. The second part of it is when, when <laughs> verse number five, when the answer came, it was not the answer he was looking for. Okay, let's look at it. Here is God's reply. The raw reply. Look around at the nation. This is God now. He's answering Habakkuk now. He's giving him an answer. He's prayed. He said, God, you're not doing anything. You are silent. You've checked out. And God brings an answer. Look around at the nations. Look and be amazed. For I am doing something in your own day. Something you wouldn't believe. Even if someone told you about it. I am... Wait a minute. This is the answer? I am raising up the Babylonian. No, God, I say you should raise a godly king that will bring revival, that will bring healing, that will bring righteousness. And you say you are going to raise the Babylonians? Those evil and wicked people? God, come on now. I'm raising up the Babylonians, a cruel and violent people. They will march across the world and conquer other lands. And he said, wait, wait, wait a minute, God. I know I say you should intervene. But this is not what I prayed for. Have you ever prayed a prayer that God answered, but the answer was not what you were Okay, maybe you've never done that. I can tell you, there are several times I've prayed and the answer did not come. I saw the answer, but I said, but God, this is not what I pray for. Why is this happening right now? I prayed for you to heal my daughter. But instead of healing my daughter, you are saying, I'm giving you grace to be able to handle the situation. No. Oh. Grace? No, I mean, heal my daughter. I mean, heal my son. And God said, no, 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 no. The way I'm going to answer is I'm going to give you strength. I'm going to give you grace to be able to do. I want you to know that my grace is bigger than the situation you are facing. God, you mean grace is the answer? Yeah, my, my grace is sufficient for you. 
Can I tell you guys something? When I was married, when I was married, right? So my wife used to come home and, and lift shoes downstairs. That thing used to get underneath my skin. So I started praying, Father, change her. Lord, change her. Lord, change her to start. Look, it may not be a big deal to you, but in my world, it was a very big deal. And so, so, Lord, change her. Change her to start taking her shoes upstairs. That was my prayer. And, and, and then, 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 then one day, I heard the Lord. It was not the answer I wanted. You know what he told me to do? He said, I want you to start picking your wife's shoes after her. Lord, that was... <laughs> No, I'm saying you should walk on her. I'm saying change her. I'm saying she's the, if she can do that, our home, our marriage will be better. If you can do that, and Begat say, ah, uh, son, the problem is not the shoes. The problem is not your wife. The problem is there is impatience in you and I'm using the shoe situation to develop character. No, you ain't going to clap this one. I know you're not going to clap on this one yet. Yeah, because we're always, Lord, change my husband. He, if he will behave well, if he will be X, Y, Z, and God said, no. There's something about you I'm using situation to develop you. To me, at the end of the day, I didn't cause it. I didn't change it. But I'm going to take what the devil meant for evil. I'm going to use it for your own growth, for your own maturity, for your own development. Can I get an amen this morning, church? I'm going to give you an answer, but it's not going to be the way you want it. Have you ever prayed, fasted? Those of you watching me at home, have you ever prayed for something? You could write it down. Maybe write on the board where you want. Have you write it down? Yeah, I pray for this, but the answer comes in a different way. And that's where Habakkuk finds himself. He prayed that God will raise a godly king. He prayed that God will raise a man that will bring revival, that will bring all this. But yet at the end of the day, God say, I'm going to raise the Babylon. The answer is going to come uh, in a different way. I'm going to use a different method. Can I tell you what one man said? He said, if your God always gives you everything you want, he is not the God of the Bible. Did you hear what I said, church? That if your God gives you everything you want, it's another God. Because the God of the Bible will sometimes bring an answer. But the answer may not be in line with what you prayed for. Why does he do that? Because he knows yesterday. He knows today. He knows tomorrow. And he makes his decisions not based on what happened yesterday, not based on what is happening right now, but based on tomorrow. He happens to know things about tomorrow that you have no clue, you have no idea. So the question is, do I focus on on the issue, on the challenge, or the difficulties, oh God, okay, God, I, I don't like it. I don't like the way the way the answer is coming, but I trust you. This is the reason why it's so. It's, if you're here on Friday, we, we talked about it's so important for you to be rooted and grounded in the fact that God loves me. God loves me. He has my best interest at heart. He will never mismanage my life. He knows what is put on the inside of me. He knows what I can handle. He knows what I cannot handle. He will not allow more to come on me for which he hasn't provided me with sufficient strength and grace to be able to handle it. Whatever comes my way, I have what it takes to be able to handle the very situation. Can we just praise him this morning, church? Hallelujah. Come on, let's celebrate Jesus. Hallelujah. Woo! Amen, somebody. If God gives you everything you pray for, it's not the God of the Bible. It's not the God of 
the Bible. Now let's look at Isaiah 55 because God's ways are different from my way. So my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. My ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. Verse number 9 says, For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Sometimes the way God handles situations is different. So have you ever prayed, and you have already written a script on how you want the answer? I did. I've written, what, as I'm praying, I've written the script. I say, I know you're going to get the glory this way. When it happens this way, oh, God, if you do it X, Y, Z, I know how you should answer this prayer. So just go ahead and do it, right? Okay, I'm, maybe I'm the only one that prays with the script, right? But I discover that that's not the way God operates. That when I pray, I leave the final outcome to him. I pray. I trust him. But, but, but I trust him to walk it out in the best way he seems fit for me. I don't determine the outcome of what is going to happen, but I rely on him, but I depend on him. Very quickly, I'm going to go to the third part of it now. The third part of it is, number one, is the argument between Habakkuk and God, the conversation. Number two is the answer. Number two is the silence of God. And then we'll talk about the the prayer not come, the answer not coming the way I wanted. Number three, we see that in Habakkuk chapter three, verse number 17. There is a shift here right now. Habakkuk now makes the shift. Here is the shift. Though the fig tree does not bud. What is he saying? Even though you are not you are not doing it the way I want it, I'm shifting in my mindset. Though the fig tree does not bud. And there are no grapes on the vines. Though the olive crops fails and the fields produce no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. What is he saying? Things are not working well. I've prayed. I trust you. But here is my position. In verse number 18, he says this. He says, yet. <laughs> in spite of what is going on in my life, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will worship. <laughs> I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. I'm not going to allow the situation to steal my joy. So there was a time I didn't have a child, and, and we prayed and, uh, 10 years. Uh, we prayed 14 years. There is no child. And it got to a point whereby I said, you know what? Father, if you ever give me a child or not, I want you to know one thing. You are my God. I will bless you regardless of what is happening in my life. When I get to heaven and you ask me, I know you will not ask me that question. If you ask me, how come you didn't have a child? I will say, because you didn't give me one. But I shifted in my prayer. I shifted in my focus. And I made up my mind. Lord, if this ever happened or it never happens, I will still serve you. I will still praise you. I will still celebrate you. I will not allow what is happening to weaken my faith. Am I helping anybody this morning, church? That's why David said, I will bless the Lord at all all times and his praises shall sometimes be in my mouth. No, continually be in my mouth. That wherever I find myself, no matter the situation, you are God and you are God alone. No matter the storm, no matter the wind, no matter the rain, I put my trust in Jesus. Can I, can I get an amen this morning, sir? Regardless of what is happening, I'm not serving you because of the good things you do for me. No, whether this happens or not, you are my God. Habakkuk resolved. Habakkuk shifted. Habakkuk said, no, I'm not going to focus on this. Here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put my focus on you. I'm not going to put my focus on the Babylonians. I'm not going to put my focus on the situation. I'm not going to put the focus on what is going on around me. I will lift up my eyes. I will look to you. Say amen, church. Let the 
focus from your daughter. Take the focus from your son and say, God, I look to you this morning. I trust you. I depend on you. I rely on you. Give me the wisdom. Give me the strength. Give me the grace to be able to handle this situation. Say amen, church. Amen. amen. Joseph says something. Joseph had 13 years of silence. 13 years. He's in the pit. God, are you not seeing what is happening in the pit? He's in Potiphar's house. God, are you not watching what they are doing to me? He's betrayed and lied on by Potiphar's wife. And God is seeing all these things. But God, aren't you going to do something? But it's something that Joseph had in his mind. God, you love me. You know, one of the greatest things you need to be established in is in this thing here. God loves me. If you don't understand that God loves you, then the things that happen, Satan is going to use those things to say, God does not love you. If he loves you, why is X, Y, Z happening? No, Satan is too late before the problem happened. I already know that God loves me. I'm loved by God. He loves me. Stand to your feet this morning. <laughs> Did you get the message this morning, church? At the end of the day, here is Joseph's statement in Genesis chapter 50. He said, you meant it for my death, for my destruction, for my downfall, for my failure. But God turned it around. Satan, you intended to hurt me. You intended to hurt me. Everything happening right now, Satan's plan, the divorce, Satan wants to hurt you. The, the joblessness, Satan wants to hurt you. He said, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to the position so I could save the lives of many people. Can I tell you something? No matter what you're going through right now, your faith in God will turn everything around in your own favor. Say amen, church. So, let me tell you this story and then we're going to pray. So, I need to fly from Abuja to Lagos. On my last trip last week, I need to, to fly from Abuja to Lagos. And so I flew from Lagos to Abuja. My flight was 2 o'clock. So I just assumed that coming back to Lagos to fly back to America is going to be a 2 o'clock flight. So I called my younger sister. Hey, could you come to the hotel by 12.15 to pick me? Because it's about 20 minutes to the airport. And then I'll be able to fly to Lagos on my way back to America. And so, so my sister comes. She said, are you ready? I said, well, let me even look at my what time my flight is, because I didn't even check. I just assumed that it's 2 o'clock. So let me check it out. So I checked my flight. It was 12.15, and I discovered that my flight was 12.30 flight from, Lake, from Abuja. But I'm not going to panic, because I have a God who is in charge of my life. Right? So I said, well, I called a friend of mine. Hey, can you put me on another flight? Book another flight for me and tell them I don't want to pay any fee for change. Let them do it for me. Amen. He said, okay, fine, we'll do it. So they put me on the 5 o'clock flight. I'm still in the hotel. I called the hotel desk. I said, hey, my flight has been delayed. It's 5 o'clock. Will you give me an extension? Hey, I'm a member of your traveling club and I'm a good customer. So I'm entitled to this. Help me. Mama, we'll give you like 2 o'clock. Well, if you give me 2 o'clock, I'll take 2.30. Well, you do whatever you need to do, Mr. Mama. I said, thank you so much. I'm relaxed in the hotel. I'm chilling. I'm fellowshipping with my sister. We're talking about God. We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about our children. We're talking about life. And then by the time it's uh, almost 3 o'clock, I check out of the hotel. And then I go to the airport. Then I check in. So I'm in my seat. And there's a lady sitting next to me. I say, how are you doing, lady? How was your trip? He said, oh, I'm so tired. I said, what happened? He said, I had a 12.30 flight. They moved it to 5 o'clock. I said, they did? He said, yeah. I said, that was my flight too. 
I'm glad that God blinded me from seeing the 1230 flight. Because if I had seen the 1230 flight, I would have been at the airport by 1030. And then I'd have to wait till, till 5 o'clock. That's almost seven hours of waiting. But because I did not see it, what seems to be a disappointment? I stayed in the hotel, chilled, watched TV with my sister. Yeah, I do watch TV sometimes. Come on, man. Yeah, I, I, I watched that and I said, wow. I came to the, to the airport, refreshed, relaxed. And I said, mm, I'm glad I did not do that. You know that many of the things that happens to us that we consider it as a disappointment, they are actually an appointment by God. Hey, you remember the scripture, Romans 8, 28, for all things work together. Come on. Can I tell you something? He's working things out for your good right now. Hallelujah. He's at work. And we know, we know, we know, we know, we have the revelation of God that is causing not some things, but everything to work together for the good of those who love. How many of you love God this morning? He's working it out. I say he's working things out for your good. I say he's working things for your good. The devil meant to hurt you with it, but God meant for your lifting, for your promotion, for your character development. That's why. Amen. So Habakkuk shifted and just said, God, thank you. I love you. I bless you. Here's my situation. Here's my question. Can you praise God? Even though things are not going the way you want them to go. That's what we're going to be talking about throughout the month of November. Can you still praise God? Can you still thank God? Can you still serve God? Can you still go to church? Can, is God still God even though things didn't work out the way you wanted? Because the devil's message is God doesn't care about you. God is, God, God is not interested in you. But we cannot receive the lie of the devil. God loves me. God cares for me. God has my best interest at heart. He's looking out for my good. And Father, I choose to praise you regardless of what is going on in my life. Hey, are you ready to just praise God for a moment? I said, are you ready to praise God for a moment? In other words, God, the situation has not changed yet. Habakkuk says, even though this is, hap it is happening, this is happening, this is happening, verse 18, he says, yet. In other words, do you have a yet praise? <laughs> you know what a yet praise it is? Do you know what a yet praise is? It hasn't happened yet. Yet! I will praise you. Woo! I haven't gotten the job yet, yet. I haven't gotten the promotion yet, yet. There is a level of praise that a, a yet praise is a praise that says, I am not going to wait for the situation to change before I begin to praise God. I'm not going to wait for that. I will bless the Lord at all times and His praises shall continually be in my mind. Job says something. Though he slays me, God, I still trust you. I haven't gotten the house. The house hasn't come through. Yet I will praise you. My husband has changed. Yet I will praise you. My child hasn't changed. Yet I will praise you. Regardless of my bank account. Yeah. I will praise you. Are you ready for us to do something this morning? Now, can I tell you something? A yet praise is different from when things are going well already. A yet praise is an announcement to Satan. He said to Satan, you think this is going to stop me? Watch me. Watch me. 
Do you know what a yet praise does? It confuses the devil. He wants you to sink into depression. He wants you to, to just belly ache, suck your thumb, eat ham, I mean Oreo cookies, I mean whatever. <laughs> he wants you to sit back and just cry. And instead of doing that, and you just say, God, I don't care what is happening. That confuses the devil. That messes him up. When you say, I won't wait for that right now. While the wall of Jericho is still standing tall, I'm going to let a shout. I'm going to let a praise. I'm going to celebrate God. Oh! Yes, hallelujah. The healing hasn't manifested yet. I will still praise you. Are you ready to praise him this morning, church? Wherever you are, just lift up your, your voice to God and say, you are God in my life. I praise you. I bless you. I honor you. You are God regardless of my situation, regardless of what I'm going through. I will bless you in spite of what I am going through, in spite of my situation, in spite of the answer. It may not be the answer that I want, but I choose to praise you. I still to give you the glory. My trust is in you. My faith is in you. I rely on you. I depend on you. Forever and ever, you are God in my life. Come on, somebody, open your mouth and praise him. Tell him, Lord, I love you. I trust you. I take the focus from my husband. I take the focus from my I take the focus from my son or daughter. I put the focus on Jesus. The Bible says in Hebrews, looking up to Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2. The author, the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. I look to you, Lord. I trust you. I depend on you. I rely. Though you slay me, I will still trust you. Declare your trust in God. Say, God, I trust you for my finances. I trust you for my daughter. I trust you with my life. I trust you. I trust you. My faith is in you. Hallelujah. I depend on you. And I thank you. And I praise you. And I give you glory right now. In Jesus' mighty name. Can we give the Lord a shout of praise this morning? Come on, everybody. Hallelujah. Come and give it to him this morning. You are worthy, Jesus. You are holy. You are good. Thank you, Father. Praise your holy name. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you worship. We give you thanksgiving. We put our faith in you. We put our trust in you. We look away from our situation, looking unto Jesus. Not looking to the situation, but looking to Jesus, perfecter of our faith. We thank you now. We praise you now. Satan came to distort the goodness of God. Satan comes alive that God is not good because of what you're going through. But what of God tells us that God is a good God. Thank you this morning that whatever is happening in our lives right now, even though God did not cause it, it's an opportunity for us to experience the miraculous power of God. Lord, I pray for men and women this morning that we be to experience your power in our finances, your power in our family, your power in our business, your power in our marriages, your power in us. You are the power of God has been deployed in this season, and you are righting every wrong in our lives. And we trust you, and we bless you, and we give you glory. And it's in Jesus' mighty name. The church say, Amen. You know, if I had time, I would be, because of time, I would not be able to do it. But when service is over, 
if you want me to pray with you or our team to pray with you when service is over I feel so strongly in my spirit man some of you need hands laid on you some of you need to be encouraged some of you need your faith to be built up why do we lay hands on you just to encourage your faith just to build your faith so when service is over if you say pastor pray for me I want you and your team to pray with me I'm going through things and I would love for the team to pray with me I would love to pray with you when service is over once we dismiss the service you just come to the altar and, and my team and I who will pray with you who will believe God with you who will join our faith with you and tell the devil he's a liar God's plans God's purpose will still be fulfilled in your life amen amen but before we go any further I want to give some people here an opportunity have you trusted Jesus you know this life was not designed for you and I to live it without faith in Jesus Life was never designed by God for you to do life by yourself without having a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to give you an opportunity. He said, I want to place my faith in Jesus. Jesus has already died. On Friday, I taught you on the benefits of the finished work. One of the benefits of the finished work is that we have, we have salvation, we have forgiveness of sins, and we are made righteous because of what Jesus did. The Bible says, He that knew no sin became sin that we who are sinners might become the righteousness of God. What does that mean? It means I'm not trusting in how good I am. I'm not trusting in my righteousness, but I'm trusting in the righteousness of Jesus. I'm placing my faith. I'm placing my trust. I'm placing my confidence in what Jesus has already done for me on the cross. If you are here this morning and you say, Pastor, please pray for me. I, I want to I want to release my trust in Jesus. I want to receive forgiveness for my sins or I want to recommit or rededicate my life to Jesus Christ. If this is where you are, can you just raise up your hand where you are? I want to pray for you this morning. If you're here this morning, just raise up your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness. Thank you over there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look at Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, do you mind coming here? I want to pray for you right now. If you raise up your hand, can you just come here right now? I want to pray. I'm not. Come on. Just come. Just come. Can you just clap for them? Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Come on, overcomer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Come on, they are coming. Can we celebrate Jesus? Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, they are still coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, they are still coming. Can we, can we just look at Jesus? God loves you, man. God loves you. God loves you. You are so precious to God. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Overcome us. Can we celebrate God? Look at God. Whoa. Whoa. Now, I want the man standing behind a man. I want the woman standing behind a woman. I stand behind them because we're going to pray for everybody here at the altar this morning. I want a woman behind a woman. I want a man behind a man. Let's do this quickly. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Yes. This is a big moment. I want, I, yes, 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 yes. And whoever you're standing behind them, you are going to take their number at the end of service and you are going to be, become their spiritual father and mother. Amen. Amen. Look at me, look at me, look at me. This is the best decision you can ever make in your life. I made a decision to follow Jesus when I was in middle school, when I was a little boy. And it is the best thing that has ever happened to me. Here's what we're going to do right now. I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Repeat after me. After that, then the people behind you, we're going to pray over you. We're going to speak over you. Whatever situation you're going through, God will intervene. God will turn things around in your life. Amen. And those of you at home, if this is the decision you're making, you type where you are. I'm surrendering my life to Jesus. I want to be born again. I want to embrace Jesus. You could write that or where you are watching us from today say I'm surrendering my life to Jesus Christ can you pray with me now those of you who are here in front will you repeat after me say father I thank you you sent Jesus to die for me and on the third day you raised him from the grave
today I place my faith in you. I receive Christ's forgiveness. I receive your righteousness. I receive your salvation. I am now born again. I am a child of God. Thank you right now. In Jesus' name. Overcome us. Let's rejoice with heaven. Hallelujah. Father, thank you. Praise you, Jesus. Glory to God. Church, will you stretch your hands towards them? Those of you touching them, pray for them. Ask God to do something special in their life. Ask God to preserve them, keep them, sustain them. Let the power of the Holy Ghost overshadow you right now. Be healed in your body. Be healed in your body. Lord, strengthen them. Lord, keep them. Help them to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus with the power of the Holy Ghost over your life over your life in the name of Jesus. Lord, sustain them. Keep them. Help them to live for you. The Bible says as many as receive him, today you give them the power, the authority to become sons and daughters of the living God. Thank you for moving in their lives. Thank you for changing their lives. Thank you for healing them. Thank you for deliverance in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone shout amen. Congratulations to you, man. You're a member of the kingdom of God. Congratulations to you. Welcome to the kingdom. Welcome to the kingdom. Welcome to the kingdom. Welcome to, to the kingdom. Welcome, welcome to the kingdom. So excited for you. Hallelujah. Yes. Welcome to the kingdom. We love you. Welcome to the kingdom. Welcome to the kingdom. So you take their phone number. Yeah, you pray for her. Pray for her. Keep praying for her. Pray for her. Martin, is all yours. Take the information. Yes, 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 yes. Oh. Oh. Okay. I have somebody here. They are taking their information. They are taking their information. Yeah, give them one of those cards. Let them fill it up. Yes, yes, yes. All right, Pastor Dennis, can you lead them to the back there? Can you lead them to, to Pastor Don? Look at Jesus. Look at what he's doing. Is that your friend? Is that your friend? Is that her friend? That's what? Oh, she just gave her life to Jesus Christ. You invited her? But imagine if you did not invite her. Wow, 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 wow. Isn't God a good God? Hey, I decree this will be your best month ever. November. Hallelujah. Amen. Pray the harvest. Pray the harvest. Amen. All right, very quickly, you can be seated this morning. We're going to do two things. Uh, is it two things? I'm going to do two things. One, I'm going to, we're going to bring our offerings to worship Jesus. And then we're going to partake of the communion. So, Pastor Larry, make sure that they bring them on time for they can join us in the communion session, okay? So, we're going to bring our gifts. We're going to bring our offerings to worship Jesus. Thank you for your generosity. I want you to know this, church. Whenever you give, those of you watching us at home, anytime you give, your giving makes a difference. When I see people who give their life to Jesus Christ today, it's because of your generosity. It's because of your giving. When you pay tithe, when you give offerings, that makes it possible for us to keep doing ministry, for us to keep reaching people, for us to keep preaching the gospel. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. So here are the different ways to give. If you want to use a credit card or debit card, if you raise up your hand, we have people in the aisle that will help you. There's somebody, if you want to use a debit card, uh, yeah, there's somebody, I don't know if, are you raising? If you want to use a debit card, credit card, you raise up your hand, our team will see you and then come to assist you. They will come to you to serve you. Or others, you can scan, there is a barcode at the seat you are sitting on this morning. There's a barcode there, you scan it, it will take you straight to our giving portals. It will take you for our giving portals, and then you are able to give. If you want to use Cash App, all the different ways of giving is on the screen. Either you scan the barcode in front of the chair you're sitting on, or you scan the one on the screen, and then you are able to give. Or if you are writing a check, you'll make it to OCF. It's an abbreviation. I want to say thank you for giving. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you. Because whenever you give, you'll make it easy for us to do ministry. 
they would make it easy for us to preach. In our church, we don't emphasize about money, but however, when you give, it makes it easy for us to serve other people, for us to reach other people. And I know Overcomers is a very generous church, is a very giving church, so I want to say thank you in advance. Thank you for giving. Thank you for giving. So others, if you're writing a check, the offering plate is going to pass by, and then you can drop it in the offering plate. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray over our offering right now, and then we can begin to give. I'm going to pray over our offering, and then when we finish with that, while we're doing that, the worship team will lead us in a song, and thereafter, I I'm, we're going to partake of the communion, okay? So let me pray. Father, what a joy, what a blessing that we, we can worship you in our giving. We bring our offerings, we bring our tithes, we bring our gift to you because we, we love you so much. We want to be part of your plan for humanity. We want to be part of what you're doing on earth. And every time we bring our resources, every time we bring our, our gifts, money becomes available so we can reach help other pastors so we can help uh, uh, preach the gospel so we can reach our city and our community we give you all the glory and all the honor we thank you that every need is met in our lives we call every need met those who have no job we decree you are gainfully employed in the month of november though we pray for increase and promotion we call every need met in your life Thank you for the month of November. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. All right, so we can give now. The worship team are going to lead us. No, hey, no. hallelujah. All right, all right, all right.
I'm going to read a scripture and then we are going to participate in the communion. If there are people in the hallway, will you ask them to come in as we participate in the communion? And I'm going to explain to you in a moment what the communion is all about. We always stand up. If you are able to stand up, I said, respect for God. No, I have one already. Thank you so much. Yeah. So we are coming to the Lord's table. We come with honor. We come with respect. We come because we're so grateful because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. We come with humility. Can I tell you something? Whenever you come to the Lord's table, you don't live the same way like you came. Anytime you come to the Lord's table, how many of you realize that everything you need, it's on the Lord's table? So this is an opportunity for those of you, if you are sick in your body, it's an opportunity for you to receive healing in your body. It's an opportunity for you to say, God, I receive my provisions, everything I need for the month of November. On Friday, I shared with us that God will not allow you to enter a new day if he doesn't have a new provision for you. He will not allow you to step into the month of November if he has no provision for you. For the fact that he allowed you to see another day is indicative of the fact that he has already provided everything you need. I want to share a scripture with you. It's Psalm 105 verse 37 in the Passion Translation. Psalm 105 verse number 37. The scripture is talking about how God brought them out of Egypt. You know, Egypt is a type of the world. Egypt is a type of sin. It's Egypt is a, a type of the world. God came and rescued them from Egypt. And there was a shedding of blood. And then there was a communion. They partook of the Passover before they left Egypt. They ate the Passover. They partook of the Passover. There was the, 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 the lamb that they ate. <laughs> and then there was the communion cup, which represent the blood. It's, an, it's indicative of what Jesus will do for us in the New Testament. And the Bible says in Psalm 105 verse 37, He said, at last, God freed all the Hebrews from their slavery and sent them away laden with the silver and gold of Egypt. And not even one was feeble on their way out. What does that mean? The scripture is telling us that when God brought them out of Egypt, he provided everything they needed. Can I tell you something? As we live another October and as we walk into a new month, everything you need is already provided for the month of November. Come on. By faith, it's already provided. You don't need to stretch yourself out. Remember, healing is already provided. So what do we do? We just receive. The Bible said there was not anybody who was feeble. The word feeble means there was no one that was weak among them. None of them, all the translations say no, none of them stumble. None of us, they could walk straight, they could walk right, they were erect. I want you to know something. When you partake in the communion, no reason for you to stumble in the month of November. Come on now, the life of God is flowing through you. The health of Jesus is flowing through you. The Bible says when they partook of the Passover, they were strengthening in their body. They were healed in their body. They had provisions, everything they needed. So when we take the cup and when we take the bread, it represents what Jesus did on the cross for us. So I have a right to walk in divine help. I have a right to have all my needs met. So we are going to make our confession this morning. We're going to make our declaration. You take the bread out at home. If you're watching us at home, you can follow us as well. You've got orange juice. You've got a piece of bread or cookie. Then join us as well. Folks, it's not this. It's faith behind what we are doing. How come some people partake of the communion and nothing happens in their lives, but others partake of the communion and they experience miracles in their lives? It's faith. Some people partake of the communion and they expect what Jesus has already done to be made manifest in their lives. When I partake of the communion, I expect everything in, that we're going to declare that it is happening in my life in the name of Jesus. So lift it up right now and we're going to make a confession. We're going to make a confession. One to go. Thank you, Father, for the gift of your son. Okay, hello. We're going to declare it, okay? It's a declaration we are making. 
So as much as possible, I don't want any movement right now. If you're going to move, move now. But I don't want any movement while we are partaking of the communion. We just, just be still and let's just partake. Amen. Because you need to receive too, right? Amen. Amen. So are you ready? Okay. Let's go. Thank you, Father, for the gift of your son. By the stripes that fell on his back, my body is healed from the crown of my head to the very soles of my feet. Every cell, every organ, every function of my body is healed, restored, and renewed in Jesus' name. I believe and I receive. Amen. You may receive now. All right, take the cup. Are you ready? Okay, one to go. Lord Jesus, thank you for your precious blood. Your sin free, disease free, poverty free. Life is in your blood. And your shed blood has removed every sin from my life. Through your blood, I am forgiven of all my sins past, present, and future, and made completely righteous. Today, I celebrate and partake of the inheritance of the righteous, which is preservation, healing, wholeness, and provision. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving me. And the church say, Amen. You may partake of the cup. Don't move anywhere. Just remain where you are. And if you need healing, you can receive healing now. Whatever you need. How do you receive? With the declaration of your mouth. I am preserved. I am healed. The blood covers me and my family. We are protected. We go out protected. We come in protected. No weapon formed against me and my family will prosper in the month of November. Everything we need has been abundantly supplied. Jesus is our shepherd. Therefore, we lack for nothing. We want for nothing. Thank you for the finished work. We partake of all that you did on the cross for us. We partake of divine health. We partake of provisions. We are protected. No evil will come near us. In the name of Jesus, we thank you now for your covering and your protection of our lives. In Jesus' name, and everyone say amen. Very quickly, without you moving, I sense strongly we should pray for election night. That any plan of the devil to bring violence to the land of America, just because some people, maybe the, the result is not how they wanted it to be, and will seek to ferment trouble, and so division, and so discord, and also, let's pray that the Lord will expose the plans of third parties, nations that prefer one candidate or the other who are trying to sow discord in America. Let's decree, decree that the plan will not succeed and that we have a peaceful election in America on Tuesday night. Can you open your mouth and pray? Open your mouth and pray now. We pray for peace in our land. Father, bless America. Lord, we release angels over the land. The angel of protection over America. No plan of the devil will succeed. Every third party that will seek to sabotage, that will seek to bring division in the land of America, we reject it this morning. In the name of Jesus, Satan, we reject you. We take authority over your plans. We say you will not succeed. In the name of Jesus, we come against violence. We come against division. We come against the destruction of properties and human lives in America. We thank you now and we give you the glory in Jesus' name. And everyone shout, Amen. I have one announcement. The announcement is if you're a dream teamer on the, on the, the 22nd and 23rd, we have a retreat here in the church. It's not going to be on Zoom. This retreat will come here Friday night, 7 p.m. 
and we don't sleep here we go home and then we'll come back saturday morning at nine o'clock it's leadership retreat dream if you serve in any capacity you are expected to be there november 22nd and 23rd is before thanksgiving it's before is the week before thanksgiving friday saturday and also on sunday invite somebody you see she invited her, her, her friend's daughter and her friend's daughter gave her life to jesus christ today you'll never know see your invitation can make a difference in somebody's life amen next sunday is veteran sunday am i right about that you guys are not excited about our veterans man come on man well next sunday we want to make a big deal because we really appreciate the sacrifices and the things we did so we want to celebrate all the veterans in our house next sunday and those of you who are veterans can you bring your fellow veteran with you on sunday because we want to pray over them and speak blessings over their lives. Amen.